Hey everyone, Trace here for DNews Plus. This is episode two in our Svalbard Seed Vault series where we're interviewing Marie Haga, executive director of the Crop Trust. If you were here yesterday, you heard some really awesome stuff. Guess what? More awesome stuff today. I'm on vacation this week, so we wanted to really share this with you. She is super awesome. I hope you enjoy it. So uh, you have all of these different varieties of seeds. Is there anything you would like to have that you haven't figured out how to store yet? Or other than potatoes, I guess? Well, uh, banana is another one where, for which we use um, cryo. Um, and the re these, te these technologies can be improved all the time. Uh, but for the major plants, for food security, uh, we do have technologies to, to look after them. And you know, there's a tremendous diversity out there. Um, you can take, we spoke about potatoes, there are 4,500 varieties of potatoes, 3,000 varieties of coconuts, yes. um, 35,000 varieties of corn, 125,000 varieties of wheat, or 200,000 varieties of rice. And we are concerned to conserve each one of those, each one of those 200,000 varieties of rice, because one of those might have the trait that we need in the future to adopt the rice to whatever it is, higher temperature, higher salinity in the soil, more unpredictable weather, uh, a variety that can fight a new pest or a new disease. And for each one we lose, we lose options to develop plants with traits in the future. So we just need to be sensible enough now as a world community to safeguard what we have. Um, we have lost a tremendous amount, uh, and certainly in the field we have lost, you know, huge amounts of, of diversity. Um, the U.S., for example, um, have lost 90% of fruit and vegetable varieties in the field. Um, China has lost 90% of their rice varieties in the field since 1950. The U.S. figure is from 1900. Um, so, you know, out in the field we have lost a tremendous lot of diversity and uh, that is sad. Um, the good thing is that a lot of the diversity has been conserved in plant gene banks, not all. So there are things that are gone forever, um, but we do have quite a bit in the plant gene banks of the world. And um, that is, of course, um, extremely good. Uh, since uh, we use very little diversity in the field and have lost a tremendous amount in, in yeah. the field. Yeah. But uh, we just got to make sure that we safeguard it all. Uh, because, again, what, when you lose it, you lose options. Yeah, you lose it forever. Yeah, what's yeah. dead is dead. <laughs> yeah. So the vault is filled with boxes, the boxes are then filled with packets. What is in the packets? You know, what does that look like? Seeds, yeah, quite simply seeds. So normally somewhere between between three hundred and five hundred seeds in alum, in these aluminum foils envelopes, and that's all there is, nothing else. Yeah, it's the whole process seems essentially just so simple. It just seems like why didn't we think of this earlier? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, people have thought of it earlier in the sense that we have conserved seeds in plant gene banks uh, for quite a few years. Um, what is unique in Svalbard is that we collect seeds from absolutely all over the world, or countries or institutions, NGOs, choose um, to use this as a backup facility. It is the institution that have deposited the seed that also owns the seed, and that's actually quite important. So no one else can call the seeds back, for example, uh, than um, the ones that have deposited them. So it, it's not the crop trust that owns the seeds, it's not the Norwegian government that owns the seed, it is the depositor that owns um, the seeds. And you know, yeah, in a way it, it, it's a very simple thing. Um, and many of these seeds can be stored long term, like wheat for example can be stored tremendously long. Um, if everything is done right, from uh, the seeds is collected in the field until it is in the vault in Svalbard. Um, 
probably some of these wheat varieties can stay up there for a thousand years and they are still viable. Um, but now there are other types of seeds that cannot be stored that long. Take lettuce, for example, could probably only um, stay there for 55 years um, and be viable. So for those, and so we need at some stage to have a system for making sure that uh, seeds are regrown and then taken back to the vault. Um, but as of now, that is not a problem, but this is something we will have to look into in the years to come, how we can create those procedures so we safeguard that the seeds are sufficiently fresh and viable. But of course, sufficiently fresh, a thousand years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, <laughs> for some of these, it's not a major problem yeah. in quite some time. <laughs> some of the stories that I've read are things like uh, countries like North Korea have seeds in the vault, as do countries that are enemies of North Korea, but they could sit essentially on the same shelf. Can you speak to how that works? Yeah, no, that's part of the fascination in the vault. Um, it's a very, very very friendly place, you know, there we, we do have seeds from absolutely all over the world. Um, Russian seeds and Ukrainian seeds are literally on the same shelf. Yes, there are seeds from South Korea, from North Korea, well, basically from all over the world. And um, people can participate in this um, project, this idea that the vault is um, without any other commitments, but using it as a storage um, facility. And, um, but, it, but it's not any storage facility. I mean, it is storage of um, a natural resource. Yeah, I, I think uh, the scientific community kind of transcends a lot of the political diversity that exists. No, but it's, uh, that's part of the fascination of working with scientists. There's a lot of work that can be done across borders that probably politicians don't know about <laughs> yeah. or that is politically difficult uh, to do, but uh, that politicians still would accept that scientists um, do. Mm -hmm. So it is uh, something about the scientific community being able to play a part that uh, at some, in, in certain instances, uh, goes beyond politics, and I, I think that's part of the fascination. So, organic and natural, and do you try and find seeds that are heirloom seeds, or is, are they just, this seed is important because it's a seed variety, and this one is also important even though it's a newer variety or a hybrid of some kind? Well, from a genetic perspective, the old varieties would be the most interesting because they have a greater diversity to them. Um, so, so we will always be looking for the older um, varieties. But we are also doing projects um, collecting, for example, wild relatives of the domesticated species. Um, wild relatives are, we call them wild relatives, it's a funny name, um, but they, they are actually very, very important and we we actually think that these wild relatives of the domesticated species can, can really be game changers in the way uh, we develop plants. Um, this can be, for example, a, a wheat variety that lives up on the mountaintop. And maybe that wheat variety has lived up there on the mountaintop for 2000 years. Well, if it has, then it's, it's likely that it doesn't need much water. And that's why we are interested in, in getting hold of it. Because it might not give any yield that plant up there. It might not even look like a wheat, but it is genetically a wheat. And it doesn't need much water. Well, one of the traits we need to breed for in the future certainly is plants that don't need much water. Um, so um, for us, getting hold of these wild varieties is very, very interesting. So we are, actually, we are now negotiating with 25 countries. Uh, to do collecting um, missions of, of wild relatives. Um, and these are, yeah, well, 29 crops, so the most important ones for, for food security. And we are training people to go and collect them. Um, and this is all to broaden the gene pool. So um, we are looking for, you know, varieties that have been domesticated for thousands of years, but we're also trying to go even beyond that and these wild relatives are extremely interesting when it comes to, to giving us uh, new traits. 
because you know agriculture is really facing probably its biggest challenge ever. Uh, we need to feed two billion more people in 35 years, um, and we are seven billion people now, so it's challenging in itself. And with climate change, we we need not only to produce um, more food, uh, but we need to produce it probably on less land, with less water. Um, we should use less inputs, like less uh, pesticides, um, less fertilizer. Uh, and this is just tremendously challenging. Um, so uh, we certainly need to make sure that we safeguard all the options um, we have. And uh, it's very hard to see how we can deal with this dual challenge of population growth and climate change unless we go back to these building blocks of agriculture that crop diversity really is. Again, still great. I talked to her for a little while longer, so there's a little more interview here. If you have any questions that you want to know about the Seed Vault, I'm going to go down into the comments when I get back from vacation and answer them for you. So let us know down there. Make sure you subscribe so you get more DNews Plus, and I'll see you later.